Stories from Friends. This is the first part in a four part event series where four experienced storytellers will take turn telling stories. Join us next Tuesday at the same bat time and same bat channel for part two where our second storyteller, Solve Eggers, will continue our series. Tonight we are joined by Joyce Morgan Young, a Southern farm girl, lifetime educator, and regional teller. Joyce Morgan Young takes her audience on journeys through a small town and into the lives of her very many Morgan relatives, including local Downton Baptist Church associate pastor, Brian Hoysa. Joyce is one of the founders of the Azalea Storytelling Festival in LaGrange, Georgia. Joyce is joining us tonight live from the black box of the Lafayette Society for the Performing Arts in LaGrange, Georgia. I wanted to extend a special thanks to the staff at the Black Box for assisting with lighting, sound, and setup. Joyce does have a small live audience with her tonight. At the end of Joyce's telling, there will be time for some audience questions. If you have a question for Joyce, feel free to send them in using the Q&A box or the chat box. I'll relay all questions to Joyce at the end of her storytelling tonight. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Joyce Morgan Young. Twenty years ago, I was sitting at my desk in Auburn, Alabama, where I worked with the Auburn City Schools. When there was a gentle tap on my door and my secretary, Kathy, kind of opened the door a little bit and she said, Miss Morgan, I'm pretty sure your father is on the phone. So she forwarded the call and I said, hello? Well, how are you, baby? I said, well, daddy, I'm just fine. I'm just fine, how are you? He said, I need you here tomorrow at 2 p.m. Now I am in Auburn, Alabama. Daddy is in Jackson, Georgia. It is 115 miles apart. I said, Daddy, I don't know, but I'll check and I'll be back with you shortly. Call you back. Okay, but I need you here, two o'clock tomorrow at Haston. Thank you, Daddy, I'll see what I can do. So I go out to see Kathy, who is sitting there, not with a little grin, but a big grin, as well as Jackie across the way, who's the receptionist. I think she even has a bigger grin. Only to find out that my father, Otha John Morgan, had called the Auburn City Schools, and when the receptionist answered, he simply said, is the baby in today? And she said, very professionally, sir, I'm not sure about the baby, but let me check and I'll put you on hold. So she looked over at Kathy and Kathy said, baby, cause she kind of had heard that. And she said, Jackie said, do we have any babies here? And Kathy said, yes, Miss Morgan. There goes your demeanor of the associate superintendent of Auburn schools. I'm now the baby. And fortunately it was only those two that for the next nine years would occasionally call me that. I don't think they told anybody else. But Kathy worked to see what she could do and she said, Miss Morgan, I believe that you can go. So I worked a little later that day, came in a little earlier the next morning and at 11 a.m., which is really 12 p.m. Eastern time, I was over in Central time, I left. I've got two hours to get there. I get in my car and I go up in State 85 and come right into LaGrange in Troop County where we have our main home. My husband and I have a home there and a small home down in Auburn. I turn east. I go through a lot of little towns. I eventually get to Griffin. I go on past Griffin and I go over in a state 75. And to my amazement, I look up and there is a beautiful new water tower. And it has welcome, two is in very little letters, but in the biggest letters that you can imagine, 
it says beautiful butts. And then it says county in real little letters. True, I grew up in Butts County, named for a very famous revolutionary soldier, but I was well past 50 before I acknowledged to anyone that I was from Butts County. And I have never had the pleasure of telling about winning the second place in the Miss Butts contest. It was a lovely day. I was a probably early college student and they had a runway going out from the courthouse and it was just the thing to do. Now, my mother was not happy. My father was ecstatic. He thought it was wonderful. And you had to wear a swimsuit. But I mean, you know, they came way up, went way down. And then you, oh, with spike heels, of course. And then you had to wear something real fancy. And you could wear a hat if you want to. I didn't wear a hat. But I won second place. And, you know, I was not even disappointed. In fact, I was very happy because first place, had to wear a ribbon that said, Miss Butts, when she entered the next level of competition. And I'm just happy with a little bitty trophy that I have in my study and pretty proud to be the second Miss Butts. And besides, I knew Lydia Webb was gonna win it. She had already won the Miss Pimenta Peppa over in Woodbury, Georgia. So she was used to winning beauty contests and she probably didn't mind that ribbon. But anyhow, as I saw that water tower, I couldn't help but think about the Miss Butts contest. But I'm going on into town, and as I'm going in, on into town, I began to think about what a really wonderful place this is. My sister, Linda, who is two years older than I, we had a wonderful raising. We grew up out in the country on a dirt road on a 125-acre farm, and we were truly free-range children. We could go to the bottom land. We could go over to the tenant house and visit with the folks there. We could go to the pear tree way down in the woods. We could go anywhere because there wasn't anybody else out there. Well, by this time I'm getting on into town and, and I get to Hastings and it's 2.05. I thought that's pretty good. You know, I had 115 miles to go. I knew mother and daddy would be there. They're always early. I'm usually five minutes late. But I go in and mother and daddy and Ricky Ballard, the owner of Haston, are sitting there. Haston is Haston Funeral Home. I am there to help my parents make their final funeral arrangements. Well, the first thing we're doing, and they're already talking about the vaults. And I hear Ricky say, well, you know, there's a steel vault or there's a concrete vault. And my mother said, I do not want a concrete vault because I heard somebody say rats could get in there. And I said, mother, rats cannot get through concrete. I want a steel vault. Well, okay, steel vault you shall have. We then go into the room where they have the caskets and there are about 15 caskets that range from 2,500 to 30,000. Well, daddy is immediately drawn to the one with the pine trees because you see our lovely farm with 150 head of cattle is no longer pastures and cattle. Daddy sold that all off and planted the whole farm in pine trees. We are now pine tree farmers. So naturally he was drawn to the one with the pine trees. Now, as we progressed along the way, I learned that you can have one, two, three, or four lids. And of course, the higher you go, the more they cost. Well, the casket that I saw gave me the most trouble was the one with the handgun. Why in the world? But I thought maybe they're a marksman. Maybe they were in the Olympics or something. But we passed that one right by. Then there's the one with the church with the steeple. You know, this is the pillar that's up above you. But then mother migrated down to, and I could see she was looking pretty interested in this one. And it was a blue background and it had praying hands. And there wasn't just one set of praying hands. It was a family of praying hands. There were praying hands in the middle and kind of to the side and to the side and to the side. There were five sets of praying hands. Oh, she said, this is it. I said, wonderful, Ricky. Mother will take the praying hands. Daddy will take the pine trees. Oh, no. My daddy said, I will not. I said, Daddy, you said you liked it. We will have the same thing. I said, you are not going at the same time. I do not think. Nonetheless, I'll take praying hands. And so two caskets with praying hands. 
we go back into Ricky's office and there are about 10 items you've got to check off the florist, the soloist, the organist, the minister. You even have to pay for opening the grave, which I guess is quite reasonable. And then there's that professional service fee there too. Well, Ricky figured it all out. He had two contracts there, each with the 10 items on it. Mother signed hers and daddy co-signed or witnessed, I think it was. Daddy signed his and mother witnessed. It was a triplicate. So Ricky ripped off the top two and kept the bottom one and put it in his file. We left there and went straight to the bank because well, my cousin, Larry Morgan, was the vice president. And there we bought two CDs, two five-year CDs. Now, my parents at this time are 84 and 86. And daddy said, Larry, I don't know why we can't get a 10-year CD. And Larry said, well, Uncle Otha, you know, a five-year CD will renew and it'll be just fine. So we did. Then we left that. Well, by this time, we're hungry. So we go to the place everybody goes, and that's Fresh Air Barbecue. It's been there since 1929, and it's got the finest barbecue you have ever had. We go in and we sit down at that table that has a sawdust floor, and we have Brunswick stew, barbecue sandwich, potato chips, and a Coca-Cola. That's what we all have. And we're sitting there just kind of patting ourselves on the back thinking, oh, we have really done a very good thing. And we're just talking along and just talking. And, and suddenly I think about something. Linda lives across the pasture. Linda is retired. Linda's husband is ill, but Linda lives across the pasture from the farmhouse. And so I said, where's Linda today? And my daddy looked at me as if I did not have good sense. He said, Joyce, you know, everybody else in the world knows that on Thursday at 2 p.m., Linda goes to the beauty shop. <laughs> and that's true. She does, and she still does. So initially I was somewhat taken back, but then I thought about it. I wouldn't have wanted to have missed this for the world. I think it might be better to be the baby. Well, a couple of months passed and Bill and I are talking about what mother and daddy had done. And we don't even have a place to be buried. So Bill says, well, we probably need to get a final resting place. And we decide, we discuss our options. We're members of LaGrange First United Methodist Church and there's a beautiful columbarium there. It even has a stained glass window from one of our past churches. You know, it's kind of this big box with little bitty drawers. And those little bitty drawers have name plates on them. And then they have the date of your birth and a dash. And then after you die and they stuff that box with your ashes, they put the other date on there for when you died. And they have flowers planted around it. And they have a lovely fence, which is locked. And if you're a family member, you can go in. So that's one option, columbarium. Well, the second option is where Bill's parents are buried, and that's in Danville, Illinois. Lovely town, a beautiful mausoleum, eternal care, but it is 700 miles from us. And if we think we might not be visiting LaGrange, we sure as heck aren't going to get any visitors up in Danville, Illinois. So it just was natural that we decided that we should go to Macedonia Baptist Church Cemetery. Macedonia Baptist Church is one mile from my home, two miles from my grandmother and granddaddy Morgan and where I was raised. So I called daddy and say, daddy, Bill and I'd like to come over the first Saturday that it's convenient for us to come and we'd like to, to look, we're not gonna make up our mind yet because I knew he would tell everybody that I was what I was doing. We're not gonna make up our mind yet but we're gonna look at a cemetery plot. 
okay. Well, I mean, he called me back in 10 minutes. You can come this Saturday. I already talked to Mr. Philip Bunch, the cemetery chair, just come right on. We you need to be here by 10 o'clock. So that Saturday morning, Bill and I got up in LaGrange and we made a similar trek to what I had done when I came from Auburn after I got to LaGrange. And, and we passed all those small towns. We passed Griffin. We went over Interstate 75 because Jackson's about halfway between Atlanta and Macon. And then I looked up at welcome to beautiful butts and kind of chuckled to myself. And we went on into Jackson. And as we went through Jackson, I did a nod over to Hodges Hardware, where I had my first job as a 14-year-old, a drugstore that I had worked at when I was in college, the flower shop where one of my boyfriends had given me the most beautiful cassage for homecoming, which was one reason he was my boyfriend. <laughs> but we went on past Pace's flower shop, and then we went on east of town and, and turned north on Halls Bridge Road. That's a nice paved road with lines on it. Now, when I was growing up, it was dirt. We went two and a half miles and we came to God's country. We turned in to the left. There's a sign of the Morgan Road. We turned into the left. We went down that road. We first passed my sister's driveway. She had built a brick house there in 1994. Then we go past the fish pond and then we get to my parents' home, an 1890 farmhouse. When, it was, when my daddy first bought it, when he was 22 years old in 1936, it had a porch all the way around it and a well on the back porch. Now it just has a porch on the front, a porch on the back and county water. Don't even use well water anymore. We turned into the driveway and I knew, I, I knew for certain that when I looked up at the kitchen window that my mother was gonna be there. And she was, and I waved and she waved. We went on around the driveway and parked our car under what when I was a child, I thought was the largest pecan tree I had ever seen in my entire life. And as an adult, it is still the largest pecan tree I have ever seen. Produces great pecans about every other year or sometimes three or four years. By the time we're getting out of our car, mother and daddy have slammed the kitchen door, coming down the stairs and coming out and lots of hugs and well wishes, but oh, daddy, he's got his car key. I mean, his truck keys. Come on, Joyce, we gotta go. I know Mr. Phillip is there. Now it's quarter to 10, I thought I was early. But we get in the truck and Bill and mother go on into the house. And daddy is a talker. I mean, he talks, talks, he's always talking. So besides daddy always talking, we've got the radio blaring. And I'm trying to get a word in every once in a while. But we get up to the church, it's only a mile to the church. We go out our road off the Morgan Road. We turn north on the Halls Bridge Road. Then we turn right onto Macedonia Baptist Church Cemetery Road, and there we are. We park the truck, we get out, and there's Mr. Philip Bunch. Oh, Miss Joyce, I cannot tell you how happy you are. I am that you are coming home. I'm not coming quite yet. I'm, you know, we're just thinking about it. Well, I've worked really hard to find you the best plot that I can. You know, we really had a run on our cemetery plots lately. You know, all those people from Atlanta coming down to Jackson Lake, they're just buying up our plots right and left because I, I guess it must be a little bit more reasonable than Atlanta. And then besides, they'd rather be buried in some safe place down here and close to their lake place where their relatives might really come and visit them. But I found a place. So daddy and Mr. Philip and I go across the road. We enter this pre-Civil War cemetery. We go one, two, three rows and we stop at four because at row four, there is this massive lot. Within the center is a headstone that says Morgan. And that's where my grandmother and my granddaddy Morgan are buried. Born in 1888 and died in 78 and 83. An aunt and uncle are there and some infants, but there's lots of room left, a whole lot of room. That's where my mother and daddy will be and some aunts and uncles and maybe even some cousins. Well, we go on down the way and 
we get to row eight. And I look over and there's a two person plot and it has a headstone that says McClellan. Well, that is my sister, Linda. She is Linda Morgan McClellan. Well, we go on nine, 10, 11. I think I might lose sight of the church, 12. And finally he stops at 13. He says, Miss Joyce, I know this may be a little further than you want to be from your parents, but like I told you, we've really been selling a lot. And there's a good thing here. Little Joyce is catty cornered. You see that cornerstone marked with an M? Well, that's for Joyce McClellan Mostella, my namesake, of course, and my sister's daughter. I don't know that that gave me great comfort, but it seemed to help Mr. Phillips' feelings. I said, well, this will be just fine. You know, I, to myself, I'm thinking it's a little further than I wanted to be, but you know, I know, I know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It will only be the shell of my body. They put my feet toward the church and my head looking that way. I think it'll be just fine. Well, what do I owe you, Mr. Phillip? Well, that'll be $200. And I thought to myself, it's no wonder those Atlanta people are buying up all these cemetery plots. And I happened to notice that my father, who never hushes, had become totally quiet. <clears throat> Philip, did you come to the last church council meeting? Well, yes, sir, I did. Well, did you listen to what we had to say about the cemetery? Mr. Otha, I am the chair of the cemetery committee. I thought maybe you had forgotten. You know, if Joyce would like this lot, it will be $1,000. I have gone from 200 to 1,000 in seconds. And Phil said, oh no, Mr. Otha, that's the fee for outsiders. And my daddy looks at Philip and he says, Joyce is an outsider, which was news to Mr. Philip and to me. And Mr. Phillips said, oh no, Mr. Otha, she is not an outsider. Well, I remember when she and Linda used to sing duets and I remember when she stood in front of the church and did the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. She certainly is not an outsider. Philip, you simply do not understand. No, sir, I don't think I do. Joyce is a Methodist. And this is a Baptist cemetery. And Philip said, but Mr. Otha, we said, you know, members and family. Joyce grew up here. Philip, it is $1,000. We'd like her to be here. It's $1,000. And my daddy turned on his heels and he walked right past row eight right past row four. He didn't even look over at his mom and daddy. He walked right on out into the road, went across the parking lot, got in his truck and slammed the door. And Philip and I just kind of standing there. And Philip said, Miss Joyce, you know, Mr. Uther was my Sunday school teacher when I was 10. When I became a deacon, he was the head of the deacons. He was the president of the brotherhood. I, I don't agree. Oh, Miss Joyce, you would never be an outsider. But I think your cemetery lot will be a thousand dollars. I can't cross Mr. Otha. I said, well, thank you, Philip. Monday, I'll send you a check. And we turned on our heels. And when we got to row eight, I was overcome. I was simply overcome because I knew that Linda Morgan McClellan had not paid 
one red cent. I mean, not one. She didn't pay zero. And she doesn't even go to Macedonia Baptist Church anymore. Why she uh, went, took herself to First Baptist Church in town. And yet they're going to let her be buried here. And she didn't even pay for her lot. I wanted to do this. <laughs> but I thought more of Mr. Phillip. And I just went <laughs> over toward her side. He was over here. I didn't think he'd see that. And then we went on past row four, and I did nod there because I have the greatest respect for my grandparents, and I would never disrespect them. And Mr. Phillip and I walked kind of quietly back to the parking lot, and he said, it's really good to see you, Miss Joyce. You're just as pretty as you always were. Thank you, Philip. I'll mail you a check on Monday. So Mr. Phillip left and I got in the truck, which had been warm and noisy and cozy and happy. And it was none of that. It was cold as ice and the radio was not even on. And my daddy, who is never quiet, was silent. He started the truck. We went out of the parking lot, down the Macedonia Baptist Church Road, onto Halls Bridge Road, back into what I had initially thought was God's country on the Otha Morgan Road. And he stopped the truck. And he kind of turned and looked over at me and said, Joyce, you know, your mom and I were really, really happy when we thought you wanted to come back here, and we still are. And I would like for you to have that plot. And you may have it for $1,000. And he started the truck, and we rode home in silence. We parked the truck and walked inside, and all this laughter is going on. You know, Mother and Bill are just having a grand time. They've already had coffee and cake. And all I wanted to do was turn around and go back to LaGrange. But my mother had dinner ready. You know, in the country, it's breakfast, dinner, and supper. And it was a good, good meal, of course. I had to choke on a little bit of it. And I never looked my daddy straight in the eye. But anyhow, we had a delicious meal and some conversation, and then I feigned something that, oh, you know, I am so sorry. I forgot that we had to get back to LaGrange. And so we left a little earlier than we ordinarily would have. We got in the car, and we went around the driveway, and so just as we're inching onto the Oath of Morgan Road, I said, you will not believe what happened at the cemetery. We got up there, and we walked past the Morgan. We walked past the McClellan. We got down to row 13, and I'm supposed to feel good because I'm catty corner to little Joyce. And then do you know what he did? Mr. Phillips said it was going to be $200, and my daddy, my daddy said, oh, no, it's not going to be $200. Joyce is an outsider, to which Mr. Phillip tried to convince him there was nothing about outsider to me. I grew up in the Baptist church. I couldn't help it. I married a Catholic and I was Baptist. We became Methodist. But, you know, we, we like being Methodist until today. Well, and you know what I've got to pay now? I have got to pay $1,000. And you know what Linda paid? Nothing. I mean, nothing. And you know what little Joyce paid? Nothing. I don't think mother and daddy paid anything either. Do you know that my husband, who is from the Midwest, he says, Illinois, but it is north and west of the Mason-Dixon line, had the little sense to start laughing. And he laughed the full six miles till we got to Jackson. He's over there now, I see him laughing. There was nothing to laugh about, I didn't think. But on Monday, I wrote a check for $1,000. On the memo, I put fee for outsiders. I wrote a letter, dear Mr. Bunch. I didn't even wanna say dear Philip. Dear Mr. Bunch, in close, please find my check for $1,000. The fee charged for outsiders 
Sincerely, Joyce Morgan Young, but I added copy. Copy sent to Otha and Thelma Morgan because I wanted my mama to know what my daddy had done. Well, about a week later, I get in the mail a yellow receipt that says, this is, this is a receipt for your lot on row 13 for the amount of $1,000. They didn't mention outsiders. For the fee of $1,000. Should you ever not need this lot, you may return this receipt and we will refund you the amount that you have paid. File that receipt away. Well, I was back home in the next month or so and mother and I happened to be in a room by herself and she said, Joyce, I, I got your letter. And I, I do not agree with your father. I would never, ever, ever call you an outsider. Why, well, I was a primitive Baptist and had to join the Baptist church. But your father feels strongly about this and I will not cross him. So there it was. And there it stayed. The next year, in 2002, Linda's husband passed of complications of diabetes and he was laid to rest on row eight in their plot. In 2004, just three years after we had made the prearrangement for the funeral service, my mother passed. She had Alzheimer's and she was in the beginning stages of it in the early 2000s. And hers was a blessed death because it had gotten very bad. She was still at home. We had lots of care coming in, but daddy wanted to care for her and he did. And she died in her sleep on September the 24th of 2004 of a heart attack. And it was a blessed death. She was 88 years old and she was at peace. Time passed, but not long after mother's death, I started a ritual that took me for many years. In my family growing up on the farm, we had the Bible reading every night. It didn't matter whether you had company, we had the Bible reading. Mother read, daddy prayed, Linda prayed, I prayed, mother sometimes prayed. I never understood that. And if we had company, they were invited to pray. Now, when I was in high school, I would think, oh, do we have to? And we had to. When I got to college and I'd bring somebody home, I thought, I am just sure. No, we'll skip that. Oh, no. Uh-uh. Mother read, daddy prayed, Linda prayed. If she was there, I prayed. Company was invited. So shortly after mother's death, I called my daddy and I said, you know, daddy, I know I'm 115 miles apart and Linda's just across the pasture. And she has all those duties. So why don't you and I start the Bible reading? And we did. And we read the Bible through three times. Now, the first time we read it, we read every chapter. Uh, uh, the second time in the Old Testament, there is some lascivious behavior <laughs> that you do not want to read about because your elderly father may want to discuss it with you. <laughs> So the second time we read the Bible through, I did pre-reading as any good teacher should do. And I'd say, chapter 25 tonight, Daddy. And he said, oh, no, I, I think we're on 24. Oh, no, no, no. You must not have put your ribbon at the right place last night. But it was an enjoyable time. And, and that happened nearly every night at 730, unless I had a Board of Education meeting. And a strange thing happened during those years. Al, who was the maintenance man at the Auburn City Schools, and I often spent many evenings there because I could sure get a whole lot of work done. And even though we had a house there and Bill would come down a few nights a week, he didn't come every night. So Al, at first, would just be sweeping outside the door or in the office next to me. And after a few years, Al's just propped up against the door because when I would read the Bible, daddy would pray. Daddy would say, amen. I would say, amen. And Al would say, amen. It was a sweet, sweet time. And daddy and Al got to meet each other one time. 
I don't know which one of them was happier, but it was a sweet, sweet tradition. And we did that for many, many years. Later, I find myself back in Jackson, gathered with friends. Natalie's there, of course, and it's Natalie's 25th birthday, May 6th, 2010. And I look up and my goodness, here come four of her friends, Molly, Amber, Lenore, Paige. They had come from Atlanta. They all looked so nice. By this time, they'd been out of Georgia Tech for three years and they've all got wonderful professional jobs and they've got on high heels and nice dress, you know, the hair. They just, they look like young professionals that they were. I cannot tell you the joy on Natalie's face when she saw those friends coming to see her on her birthday. And we visited for a little while and then she said, Mom, you think we could go get a bite? They haven't had dinner. Oh, by for sure. And I knew where they were going. They were going to Fresh Air Barbecue. I knew what they were going to have. Brunswick stew, barbecue sandwich, potato chips, Coca-Cola. Going to put their feet on that sawdust floor. Well, it wasn't too long before I got back out to the farm and went to Linda's house. And Natalie's car was there, as well as were her friend's car but the golf cart was gone because you see, we're now golf cart people on our pine tree farm. The tractor's been over there shed, it's in the barn shed for many, many years and we don't have much use of that anymore. Well, I wondered where they had gone, but it wasn't too long before I heard laughter and just lots of laughing and the golf cart comes back and these city girls are kind of hanging on and. Natalie's trying to pretend like she knows what she's doing. And they come in and, oh, they start telling me all about it. And then Molly in particular, Molly said, oh, Miss Joyce, we never knew there was a farm here that was Natalie's. Natalie had last brought friends to the farm for her third grade fishing birthday party. When mother and daddy had to do all of the baiting of the of the lures and all take off any fish that they caught while these little girls were <laughs> well these 25 year olds were just about the same molly said miss joyce i never even heard of a tenant house amber said oh the bottom land is just so pretty well natalie's friends had come we go on in the house and I get out the ice cream and the cake and the candles. Now, if I had known those girls were coming, I would have done a little differently. Natalie was 25. In a box of candles, there are 24. I did not see any reason to spend another 79 cents, and I didn't, but I would have if I had known they were coming. And when I'd said to the Piggly Wiggly, I need a Georgia Tech birthday cake, I don't think they understood. It was not orange. I mean, it was not gold and black. It was orange and black, but it tasted really good. And we had birthday cake, blew out all 24 of those candles. They had brought a few gifts. We had ice cream, a lot of laughter, gave them all a cup of coffee before they got back in their car to go that 45 mile journey back to Buckhead. And we're tired. So we all went to bed. Bill and I were there at Linda's. Natalie was there in Linda. But the next morning, we got up really early. And Linda, Natalie, and I went to town where we met little Joyce. We went back to Haston, where we had gathered the night before. We went back to Haston to say our final goodbyes to our daddy. This is on a Friday, May the 7th, 2010. On that Tuesday, Linda and daddy were going down Riverside Drive in Macon on the way to the dermatologist. My daddy was healthy, but having been a farmer, he had a lot of sunspots. He was often going to the dermatologist. When a 22 year old female texting ran out in front of Linda 
and she T-boned the car. And the airbags went off on Linda and on Daddy. And an airbag exploding in the face of a 95-year-old must be much like that of a baby that we, of course, we put in the back seat. They were rushed to Macon Medical Center. Linda was checked for bumps and bruises. Daddy was taken to the trauma unit. I was called at Auburn. I immediately left, went to LaGrangeville, and I headed to the Macon Medical Center. We were on our way. We'd gone through Thomaston and we're at a little area called The Rock when I got a phone call and Linda said, Joyce, go on home to the farm. Go home. She said, Daddy coded. And I didn't immediately know what that meant. She said, Joyce, Daddy died. Daddy can't die. I'm retiring in three weeks. Every night after we read the Bible, we talked about the banana splits we were gonna go get, the journeys that we were gonna make over to Jasper County, Monticello, where he spent his first four years, the trips we were gonna go down to the Indian Springs State Park. And then we were just gonna go back to the old farmhouse and sit on the front porch and drink all the sweet tea and eat all the cookies we wanted. But we weren't now. We were not. But here we go, Linda and her daughter Joyce, Natalie and me in for our last goodbyes and to be prepared for the 11 a.m. funeral at Macedonia Baptist Church. He looked as good as anybody could look. I knew he was happy. I knew where he was. I knew he was with mother. I knew it was only a shell. But I was saddened to my core because three weeks, just three weeks before I would have more time, he had left this earth. Well, we stayed a little while and so sort the of portly middle-aged man came in and of course he goes over to talk to Lyndon Joyce because they've always lived in Jackson and they know everybody and everybody knows them. So they chatted for a while and then he walks over to me, reaches out his hand and said, hey, Miss Joyce. I said, this is my daughter, Natalie Young. And you know, I'm just sorry. I, I haven't been here much since 1963. So tell me who you are. He said, I'm Kenny Williams. I was born in the tenant house. And from those dark brown eyes, I could remember Kenny Williams as a little kid, lived there about 10 years. He said, don't you remember, sometimes you and Linda would come over and play with me. Sometimes my mama let me go home with y'all. He said, I thought you and Miss Linda would be here this morning. And I'm coming to the funeral. Oh, I'm definitely going to be at that funeral. He said, but you know, I just wanted to come by and say something that I might not have the chance there. I don't think you'll ever know the good that Mr. Otha and Miss Thelma did. He said, I cannot, I couldn't count the times that I went to them. Mr. Otha, I'm just a little short on the money I need for shoes and on and on until it got to be college tuition. My daughter graduated from college. He said, and Mr. Otha always said the same thing. Kenny, what do you need? I tell him. Next question was, Kenny, when are you gonna pay it back? And I tell him, we always kept our word. But Miss Joyce, I'm one of many many, many that your parents helped. And I just wanted to remind you of that. I'll see you at the funeral. So we stayed for a little longer. There he was in his casket, you know, with the praying hands, the blue pillow. 
And we left because we had to go get ready. Had to go make sure we were ready. And as Linda, Natalie and I rode home and Joyce went back to get her family, Linda said, Joyce, I can tell you something a little funny. I thought, no, you can't. There is nothing funny in the whole world right now. There is nothing. And she said, well, I think you'll think it's a little funny. Daddy, I think the nurses knew he was about to die, but I did not. And the nurse said, would you like a chaplain? And I said, oh, yes, yes. And a handsome young man came in and daddy, of course, was talking. But the chaplain laid his hand on daddy's and said, may I have a prayer with you, Mr. Morgan? And daddy said, yes. And he prayed a most beautiful prayer. It was a lovely prayer and it was a calming prayer. And it was a prayer of thanksgiving for a life of 95 years. And then he said, amen. And daddy said, thank you kindly, which is what daddy always said to folks. And daddy died shortly thereafter. But Joyce, the chaplain, the chaplain was Methodist. <laughs> I thought, praise the Lord. Right is right. Well, time went on. And just as in those 10 years, anytime we were gathered with family, Morgan family, somebody would say, Joyce, tell us about the cemetery. It was a great source of laughter, most especially for Linda. And so even one time when daddy had been in the hospital and Linda and I were both there and the new preacher came by and Linda said, oh, Joyce, tell the new preacher about the cemetery. So I did. And daddy said, now did I do that? And I said, what do you think? He said, right is right. Well, now he's gone, gone to be with mother but we're still having Morgan reunions and I'm still getting requested to tell about the cemetery. And so I tell it again and they laugh. And then my cousin, Larry Morgan, who's now retired, the banker, said, Joyce, I've got two things I need to say. And if some of the rest of you wanna stick around, that'll be okay, you might enjoy this. I have decided that Uncle Otha just could not go to meet his maker, having made an allowance for a Methodist daughter, because he really did feel strongly about that. Now, you know, I'm Methodist. We grew up in the same church, but we're Methodist now too. And I think that's why he just couldn't bring himself to charge you the family or the member rate. But the second thing is, Joyce, this week, Laura and I, who are members of the First United Methodist Church in Jackson, bought us two spaces in the Stark United Methodist Church. Stark is the community that he lives a mile one way and I live a mile the other way. He said, we just, we just wanted to be buried there. But you know, Joyce, that means that there are two empty lots on row four. I didn't know he was on row four. He is younger than I. You mean there are two, two lots on row four at the Macedonia Baptist Church Cemetery? That's right. They were yours. That's right. What do you want for them? Joyce. I didn't pay for them. They're yours. They're mine. Row four, where my mother and daddy are, and my grandmother and my granddaddy. Linda's still on row eight. 
well, I could not wait to get home and pull that folder out with that little yellow receipt that said, if I didn't want that lot on row 13, that I could return that receipt and get my money re refunded. And that's just what I did. Monday morning, I wrote a letter to the Macedonian Baptist Church New Cemetery Chair, Freddie Cook, but I copied it to Philip Bunch because he and I had seen each other over the years. I copied it to Larry and Laura, and I copied it to Linda McClellan because I wanted everybody to know where I and my husband, the Midwesterner, were going to end up, that we were going to be on row four, row four with grandmother and granddaddy Morgan, mother and daddy. You know, my daddy was right. Right is right. Thank you so much, Joyce. You're very welcome. Um, we do have a couple questions in our chat box. And for our virtual audience, um, if you have a question for Joyce, you can throw it in the chat box or the Q&A box now. Um, our first question for you, Joyce, comes from Lynn. Lynn writes, was Joyce's husband really still laughing at her story? I would think he's heard this story thousands of times before. Is his enjoyment of her stories something that got them together and has kept them together? The question is, is my husband still laughing at the purchase after all these times? Yes, he is still laughing. We got together well before that, but his laughing kind of keeps my feet grounded, I think. Thank you. Um, and then Jean asks, what years were you head of Auburn schools? I was the associate superintendent. There was a superintendent head of me. I was there 2000 to 2010. And um, I would just like to know, how did you get into storytelling? Well, the cemetery story was just such a good story that I just kind of kept telling that and um, with mostly family. But we have a festival here in LaGrange, the Azalea Storytelling Festival. And Donald Davis, who is nationally and internationally known, has been our consultant and worked for us with the, for the full 25 years. He hosts a workshop in Ocracoke, North Carolina, as well as in LaGrange now. It's a week long workshop in the summer. And to treat myself for retiring in 2010, I went to Oak Coke for the week long workshop, Bill and I both went, of course. And I thought I'm just gonna go once because you know I helped chair the festival and I need to know a little bit more and uh, this will help me. And I've been back nine times and I think it's still helping me. And uh, for your audience, they should get in touch, come to the LaGrange workshop sometime. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, I don't see any other questions in our chat box from our virtual audience. So I just wanna say a quick thank you again to uh, you for being here telling our story and kicking off our first part of our four part Stories from Friends series. Um, our next Stories from Friends uh, segment will come next Tuesday, April 27th at 7 p.m. Uh, Alexandria local Solve Eggers will tell um, stories that night. She's originally from Iceland. I'm really looking forward to hearing her stories. Um, after that, we'll have Ruth walk up two weeks from tonight. Um, she'll join us on May 4th at 7 p.m. She's another Alexandria local. And Cheryl Mason will close out our series on May 17th at 7 p.m. I have thrown the links for all three of those events into our chat box, as well as a link to the Azalea a storytelling festival um, that Joyce helped uh, found. Um, if you have any interest in, in checking out the, the Azalea Festival, please do so. Um, I, I'd love to see more people get active in storytelling. I also want to say a quick thank you to the staff there at the Black Box Theater that you used tonight. Um, thank you for helping set up lighting and sound and helping us get together. <laughs> And a thank you to our live audience. Um, I just got a comment in the chat box that the live laughter was great this evening. So thank you everyone 
for spending your Tuesday night with us. Joyce, do you have any final words for our virtual audience? I certainly do. My story is completely true. Absolutely. You can't make that stuff up. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Joyce. I'm going to end the webinar now so that you can talk with your live audience. But thank you again. This was absolutely wonderful. And thank you again to our virtual audience. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.